thank you for this opportunity to celebrate Professor Shulamith Lev Alajem's wide ranging and globally impactful research. To honor its reverberations across time and space, I will begin with a brief introduction to my own work within the field before shifting to Professor Lev Alajem's prodigious scholarship. I'll share how she has deepened thinking about the racial politics of community theater sharpened feminist findings and extended impacts into how we think political theater. First, some background. I grew up in a small town in New England in the northeast of the United States. And let's see, here's my grandfather. He had been an opera singer in Europe, but my immigrant family of doctors had also migrated to performance more as hobby than profession. So we would see commercial theaters on, on Broadway and community theater in high schools and gymnasiums. These community productions inevitably reproduced middle brow fare in content and form, mostly what we call golden age musicals of the mid 20th century, carrying a narrative of American exceptionalism and social progress. I was Tobacco Girl B in Finian's Rainbow. There's Let's see if I can get that up. Oh, there it is. A musical in which a racist politician becomes black for a day, a temporary reversal that enables return to the status quo after two hours of stage time. It wasn't until college that I discovered more complex theatrical narratives, including the work of Augusto Boal. And only after graduating that I encountered Cornerstone Theater in 1989 a company whose work I analyzed in a dissertation and later book. Let's see, uh, there it is. Within the emergent field of community based theater in the United States. In its early years, Cornerstone adapted classical plays like Hamlet to small town contexts, working with community members to animate their culture through canonical stories. Productions included the Marmoth Hamlet, a musical adaptation with a small Western town featuring the mayor as Gravedigger and the town drunk as Laertes. Other productions included an adaptation of the Oristaya with a Native American community in Nevada, a mixed race Romeo and Juliet in a segregated town in Mississippi, and an adaptation of Prometheus Bound with former steelworkers staged in an abandoned mill. From the mid 1990s through the early 2000s, I felt like a pioneer. With a small band of other US based scholar practitioners, we thought through the social and artistic dynamics of community production, building off work of scholars in the UK from the 1980s. When I encountered Shuley's scholarship, reframing community theater in Israel through radical feminist, racial, and political lenses, my thinking blew wide open. There's not enough time to detail all the ways that Julie's scholarship has informed my own work and the field of community based and political theater. So I'll focus here on a few key ideas and articles accessible primarily in English. Julie's scholarship on Mizrahi community theater established a keynote of how minority theater can be framed as political intervention. In her 2010 book, Standing Front Stage, Resistance, Celebration, and Subversion in Community Theater, Shuley introduced a tripartite model to analyze Israeli community theater, resistance, co-optation, and subversion. Through this framework, she illuminated the radicality of 1970s community theater in Israel, fueling and fueled by the Mizrahi Black Panther movement. By doing so, she implicitly aligned Mizrahi theater in Israel with the Black arts movement in the US. So what had been perceived of as a historically specific racialized structure in the US could now be understood as part of a global political movement, clarifying how theater can work to reorganize social structures while also resisting conventional aesthetic modes of representation. 
The scholarship also illuminated internal class and racial politics within Israel that complicated a binary Jewish Arab framework. An early article, Between Home and Homeland, Facilitating Theater with Ethiopian Youth, elaborated on that dynamic racial complexity. Here, Shuli not only continued to archive the theatrical creations of racial minorities in Israel, but also nuanced the theater's effectiveness in generating more equitable power relations. She offers a reading in the contested space between theater as an apparatus of control from above and articulation from below. She positioned Jewish Ethiopians within an Israeli master narrative of exile that contrasted with the lived experience of racial discrimination within a hierarchy of color that positioned Ethiopians at the bottom, thus building on her scholarship with Mizrahi communities. At the same time, the article suggests that the Ethiopian youth constructed a new Afro-Israeli identity. The production that Lev Alajen hones in on, frames, illuminates how the performance could be read as animating a Bawalian image theater process, moving from the real to the ideal, while also incorporating Ethiopian storytelling and contemporary rap, conceived of as a play space that also operates within both a master narrative of return to a Jewish homeland, as well as a racialized absorption into the dominant culture through the boarding school, Lev Alajem argues that the production also animated a process of identity formation for displaced youth, complicating the very notion of home and homeland within a diasporic framework. I now had a way to rethink community-based theater in the US through our master narratives of manifest destiny the notion that God had ordained the settlement in the US to expand westward, the sometimes unspoken master narrative of white supremacy, and the always present American myth of continuous social progress. I saw distinctions I hadn't initially discerned between theater with small rural towns of primarily white settlers and theater with displaced native communities. I rethought how Cornerstone's bridge shows, which brought together residents from multiple communities, had grappled with complex racial and religious disparities. How home read differently for Arab communities in Los Angeles as for dislocated Passamaquoddy native residents in Eastport, Maine. In addition to this deepening of perspectives through attention to migration and master narratives, Shuli's work is also notable for the way that she reads community theater through a feminist lens. Her article, Community Theater as a Site for Performing Gender and Identity, addresses community theater produced with Mizrahi women in Jaffa. The article indexes Lev Alajem's ability to nimbly integrate feminist performance theory, cultural and communication studies with her work on community theater. Reading the work is both social practice and semiotic artifact. Another article from object to subject, Israeli theaters of the battered women, draws on four performances related to violence against women, arguing that they illuminate a passage from the woman as object to woman as subject, articulating herself through theatrical language. In this essay, Shuli explicates the intersection of gender and class in grappling with domestic violence, as well as how each production struggled with the relationship between ideology and aesthetics. What could have been a sentimental study of abuse instead opened up into an understanding of how community theater activates social agency. These articles also sustained thinking through the tripartite model of analysis introduced in Standing Front Stage, 
focusing on the subversive potential of women-based community-based theater following the absorption of radical energy in the community theater of the 1980s. These articles also position Shuli front stage globally. Her keynote speech at the International Federation for Theater Research in 2005 on community-based theater as citizen art of battered women inspired many of us in attendance to rethink the intersections of theater and political citizenship. But what I most admire about Shuli's scholarship and what sustains its global impacts is her ability to sit with disturbance and to rethink her own analytic frameworks. She returns to performances, to prior ways of thinking. She re-engages the archive of her own thoughts. In Bear Life, uh, Bear Theater of a Bear Life, for example, she returns to a community performance with Palestinian mothers that she had witnessed in 2008. The performance had stayed with her, despite or perhaps because of its thinness. Three women, non-actors, performing in a kindergarten sandbox with minimal props. Referencing Giorgio Agamben's conceptual frame of bare life, Peter Brooks' ideas about rough theater, and Jill Dolan's notion of the utopian performative Shuli reads the performance as a dramaturgy of disruption. She proposes that this bare performance, gesturing to hidden spaces, offers a compelling metaphor for the women's lives. The article concludes with reflexivity on her own position as a privileged researcher, but one who can offer a gift back to the performance from the intimate distance of her reflections. In The Eleventh Plague, community-based theater of the battered women, Shuli again returns to a production, this one from 2000, to dwell in ideas about intermediality. She offers a feminist reading of battered women's emergence from victim to citizen subject through the social ceremony of theatrical production. The article reads the audience as a concentric circle of witnesses that collapses into a temporary community which includes herself. She analyzes the performance as an unveiling of secrets through three genres, the realistic, the fantastical, and the allegorical, which deconstruct and then reconstruct the liberation myth of Passover. The article proposes that the production speaks back to the absenting of women in that myth, while offering also an alternative mythology. Along the way, she also reads the production as a series of politicized theatrical gestures, such as the Brechtian gestus of cleaning and the subversion of theatrical cross-dressing. The production she proposes offers the radical idea of women as the 11th plague thus exposing the patriarchal social article. She then reaches towards an even broader conclusion, suggesting that the production had disrupted the rules of community theater, which tend to favor realism, while also offering an illumination to her as the researcher, an understanding of herself as connected to the marginalized subjects of the drama. And in a recent article, she asks, where has the political theater in Israel gone? In rethinking, in thinking through this question, she ultimately extends inquiry into political theater beyond the borders of Israel. The article reverberates in part because of how Professor Lev Alajem sits with her own disturbance to allow a reaching out towards new ways of thinking political theater. She's initially inspired by a feeling of disruption at a theatrical event, Peter Harris's The Six Six Inn. The performance does not fit into her own analytic frameworks, so she extends her thinking and after careful consideration into the political, proposes Jacques Ranciere as an inspiring source who offers 
a new interpretive key. Thinking with Ranciere invites us to consider equality not as a gift from above, but as an enactment from below. The political emerges as an ongoing potentiality animated within the aesthetic realm, opening up new options for relationships by breaking out of conventional structures for political resistance and change. Within this framework, the sensuous is as vital as the semiotic. We feel with the indistinguishability of sighted and blind performers, with the African asylum seeker and the Israeli citizen to, in Shuli's words, change the cartography of the perceptible. Across all of her articles, Professor Lev Alajem's scholarship is both critically detached and intimately engaged. She concisely references vast fields of scholarship, such as 20th century alternative theatrical practices, and conveys complex ideas about, for example, postmodern performing cultures or distinct ways of thinking the political with great clarity. At the same time, her scholarship evidences deep respect for ethnographic subjects, particularly marginalized women and ethnic groups. These subjects are framed not as passive recipients of theatrical expertise, but as co-equal thinkers and makers. This is scholarship that both explicates and animates its principles, much in the way that Shuli suggests Ranciere does in The Ignorant Schoolmaster. In writing of The Ignorant Facilitator, she offers a vulnerable account of her doubts in the face of past work with elderly Mizrahi woman who confronted her by the book workshop with a collective ritual of chant and movement. Rather than continuing to resist this disruption, Shuli evocatively writes of giving in to the women's performance expertise, allowing herself to respond sensually and physically in ways that gained the women's trust. By sharing this vulnerable moment with her own student teachers and with the reader, she animates the idea of the shared collective moment that overrides the expertise of the facilitator, a moment which reveals and rewrites assumed power relations. A number of metaphors come to mind in reviewing this vast landscape of scholarship. Professor Lev Alajem is probing flashlight, revealing hidden spaces others had not considered to look at. She's an architect who continuously refreshes what she has crafted with and for others, and perhaps appropriate to the feminist perspective that permeates her thinking, she also works as a weaver. She brings together disciplinary frames that illuminate both political theory and community-based theater, alternative drama and drama in education, political theory and philosophy. In doing so, she skillfully reanimates such ideas as dramatic analysis, gender performativity, and the playful versus performing self. That is, she expertly analyzes theatrical text and performance while also reading moments within the rehearsal process without ever losing sight of the mutual influencing of her subjects upon herself. I see this kind of connectivity and return, this mobility across disparate intellectual fields as a nuanced set of tactics designed to assert the importance of performance as a vital site of inquiry and a mode of political engagement. Across a huge body of scholarship that continues to rethink itself, the linear rational and recursive sensual converge to generate a unique scholarly persona whose thinking continues to reverberate across geographical and intellectual border borders. 
Professor Shulumith Lev Alajem's scholarship prompts us to keep rethinking what it means to animate new ways of being and being together. So thank you for the invitation to share virtual time, space, and thought with all of you today in celebration of Shuli. I am a legislative theater and theater of the oppressed practitioner living in Manchester, England, but originally from New York City, uh, where I led theater of the oppressed NYC. And uh, what I think we're seeing in community theater and community arts right now, or what I'm seeing, uh, are, are two sides of a coin. One is that theater is finding itself needing to become more civically engaged, uh, more of a space that is supporting and amplifying and connected to democracy. And at the same time, I think we're seeing democracy becoming more theatrical, more creative, more open to different kinds of participation. So for example, in the work I'm doing in the UK, in legislative theater, communities that are directly impacted by unjust policies or rules make plays about their experiences with those policies and practices, and then take those plays to audiences of peers and neighbors and lawyers and advocates and elected officials and policymakers and invite those audiences to improvise new rules, new practices on stage, see how those might work, might not work, leading everybody in the room to become a policymaker. Through that process, we're making lots of concrete change here in the UK around housing and homelessness, climate policy, cultural policy, but legislative theater isn't the only way that I think that community theater is uh, engaging in civic life. So, for example, here in the UK, theaters have become places where people go to vote. They've become places where people go to have their vaccinations, where people learn about resources that they can get for the things that they need in their life. The thing I'll say is that I also see that theater is understanding itself to need to become more democratic in the way it makes decisions about its budget, its planning, the institutions that are supporting uh, theater, that in which theater lives, that they also themselves should become more participatory uh, and open up their own decision-making processes to the kind of creativity that they're encouraging in their government and their local institutions. So those are some of the things that I see happening in the community theater space today. <laughs> Уважаемые миротворцы, бо их есть царство небесное. Потом будем замолювать грехи. Смотрите, сколько с нами. Сынку, там такие же люди, как и ты. Смотрите, какая тут сила стоит. Что они да делают? А мы не плювать на вашу да силу. Да! The frustration was so big, you know, among many people, and uh, you know, this idea of, you know, violence, uh, of course, was something that was in the air, you know. And uh, through the play, we were able to talk about that, for example, in a very concrete manner.
to late stage dementia and the project was about uh, uh, working with two elder clans who came into uh, the context and developed little play scenarios that were very individualized to each person who they met. Um, so some might use humor, some might want to tell stories about their lives, uh, some might just be there to, to joke and, and take pleasure in, in kind of playing with the clans. Um, and in terms of in understanding what that impact is, uh, we had dementia researchers as well as theatre and arts researchers working with us on the research project so that we could understand impact from a number of different perspectives. <laughs> Rafiki theater ni watu wenye naonesa michezo ili watu abadilike kwa mambo ya one vita ya nyumbani two ulevi three mambo ya kupenda wanawake fa <laughs> Why don't you give me food? Why don't you to give me food? Now you're asking for food, yet you didn't even leave me with even a single coin. Didn't I leave you with money? Didn't I give you 1,000 yesterday? <laughs> Can we eat 1,000 yesterday and even today? Shut up! I don't want you to, to hear you saying anything. Eh? Stupid, stupid woman. Why don't you go to your relatives? I'm tired of seeing you. Derek, you're from drinking now. It's you're beating me when you didn't leave me with the enemy. You're business. asking for food. That's my money. You think I'm good? I am love. I am here to receive all of you and share with all my experience. Tell us, what? Es su preocupación. ¿Qué ha pasado en este territorio con la guerra entre los bípodes? Están matando a mis hijos y a mis hijas. Nos están envenenando con mercurio, con dinamita. Aunque parezcan duros, sean flexibles a los cambios y se dejen transformar. You tell someone like who doesn't know what happens in the home office, you know, it's just the people themselves are like, well, seriously, they ask you these questions. Thank you for choosing us. Refugees are most welcome here. Shalom to everyone. I'm Roni Chelben. I'm in Gara in the United States for the last 10 years, and I'm working in the Theatre of the Community with a group of people from Austin, Texas, and also a group of people who are in the United States. לדיור הוגן באוסטין. אנחנו עובדים בעיקר בתיאטרון המדוכאים, כלים של וידאו ועוד כל מיני מודלים שאנחנו פיתחנו בעקבות השנים. כשזה התחיל, אני חושבת שהקורונה הציפה המון נושאים שקיימים אינהרנטיים ל- ל- לעבודת התיאטרון הקהילתי, אבל פתאום היינו צריכים להתמודד איתם בצורה יותר אקטיבית. עכשיו, אני רוצה לבחור נושא אחד שאני חושבת שהוא כזה, בגלל שאני חושבת שהוא מאוד מרכזי לשאלה התיאטרון הקהילתי לאן, וזה הנושא של המעבר לאונליין. שמנו דגש מאוד מרכזי על העניין של 
ש- שמחוסרי בית יהוו חלק גדול בקהל שאליו אנחנו פונים. אז עשינו המון אאוטריץ' והמון המון המון חלוקה של פליירים. ווידאנו שההצגות שלנו תמיד קורות במקום שהוא נגיש למחוסרי בית, שהוא באזור שנמצאים בו אנשים ש- שהם מחוסרי בית ויהיה להם קל להגיע לשם. אז פתאום עכשיו ברור שכל חלוקת הפליירים בכלל לא הייתה אופציה, זה היה ממש בשיא הקורונה. וגם עצם זה שהאירוע הופך אונליין, שוב, מדיר באופן אוטומטי המון מקהילת מחוסרי הבית, ש- שזה לא נגיש להם שהם בכלל לא ידעו על האירוע הזה, כי, ב- כי היה הרבה פחות פרסום שהוא בחוץ, והוא לא מתווך. אני רוצה לשתף באיזה דוגמה קצרה, אני עובדת עכשיו על פרויקט שיתוף פעולה בין ישראליות לאמריקאיות, שיתוף פעולה בין ארגון שוברות קירות, בין תנועת שוברות קירות בישראל, לנשים שמתארגנות אה, ל- לשיפור תנאי הדיור שלהם ולדיור צודק באוסטין טקסס שעבדתי איתם. שייצרו ביחד אירוע של סטורי טלינג אונליין. עכשיו, האירוע הזה וה, והפרויקט הזה כנראה לא היה נולד בלי המעבר הכפוי לאונליין. ואני חושבת שזה מאפשר את, ה, את הלמידה בין מאבקים ולמידה מתנועות אחרות שהיום כולם, ברור לכולם כמה זה חשוב, אבל זה מאפשר לעשות את זה בפועל עם קבוצות שכנראה לנסוע לחו"ל לשבוע. לאימהות חד הוריות שצריכות בייביסיטר וכרטיסי טיסה להוצאות הוא משהו שהוא על גבול הלא ריאלי לרוב ה... מבחינה תקציבית. אז, אז מבחינתי זה משהו מאוד מרגש שקורה שפתאום עלה הרעיון הזה למה לא להפגיש את האנשים האלה בואו לא נעשה רק כנסים של המנחים לתיאטרון קהילתי אפשר להפגיש את האנשים עצמם ש... הם הדבר הכי חשוב בתוך הפרויקטים האלה. לסיכום, אני חושבת ששני הדברים האלה עומדים אחד לצד השני, הנגשה מצד אחד ש... שתאפשר לנו לפתוח ולהרחיב קהילות דרך הכלי האונליין, ומצד שני, כל הזמן איזושהי סכנת הדרה שצריך לשים אליה נורא לב כדי שלא ניפול לבורות שאנחנו אה, לא רוצים ליפול אליהן. אז אה, זהו, תודה רבה. Thank you.